Like the pine trees lining the winding road I've got a name I've got a name Like a singing bird in the croaking toad I've got a name I've got a name Hi, this is Ben Hart. I'm going to talk to you today about how to become a confident person. Much academic research supports the proposition that having self-confidence is the single most important factor to having a successful, happy, and fulfilling life. Having a healthy self-confidence will help you perform well in school, help you to be attractive to the opposite sex, help you to get the job you want, help you get promotions, help you negotiate for higher pay, help you to achieve your goals in life. Think about the kinds of people you would want to hire to do a job for you. Would you rather trust your life to an airline pilot who looks confident or to an airline pilot who looks nervous and unsure of himself? Do you want a confident surgeon operating on you or a surgeon who doesn't look like he knows what he's doing? Do you want a lawyer who sounds like this lawyer? Well now, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the of 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 the <clears throat> jury, um, on 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 January fourth of this year, my client did indeed uh, visit the Sackersons. Um, or do you want a lawyer who sounds more like this? I was thinking last night about this case and their theory and how it didn't make any sense and how it didn't fit and how something is wrong. And it occurred to me how they were going to come here and stand up here and tell you how O.J. Simpson was going to disguise himself. He was going to put on a knit cap and some dark clothes and he was getting this white bronco and this recognizable person and go over and kill his wife. That's what they want you to believe. That's how silly their argument is. And I said to myself, maybe I can demonstrate this graphically. I'm going to show you something. This is a knit cap. I'm going to put this knit cap on. And you've been seeing me for a year. If I put this knit cap on, who am I? I'm still Johnny Cochran with a knit cap. And if you look at O.J. Simpson over there, and he has a rather large head, O.J. Simpson, in a knit cap, from two blocks away, is still O.J. Simpson. It's no disguise. It's no disguise. It makes no sense. It doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Now, you can certainly make a strong case for setting goals as being an even more important factor than confidence for achieving success in life. If you don't set goals, you'll never achieve them. That's certainly true. But people who lack confidence tend not to set goals because they don't believe they can achieve their goals anyway. People who lack confidence tend not to act. People who lack self-confidence have trained themselves to expect failure. They then become paralyzed into inaction by this fear of failure. They become psychologically almost incapable of setting goals. This is why I would rank having self-confidence as the single most important factor in determining whether you will have a successful, happy, and fulfilling life. I would actually say that having self-confidence is a necessary prerequisite to setting goals because self-confidence means that you believe that you can and will achieve what you set out to achieve. The opposite of self-confidence is the belief that your efforts will result in failure, that you won't be able to achieve the desired result. You drive a car, after all, because you are confident that this will allow you to get to your destination. But what if you believed that every time you got into a car, that you would end up in a car crash? This would cause you to avoid getting into a car at all costs. Some guys never get around to asking a girl on a date because they expect rejection. They think they will look foolish. They imagine humiliation. They imagine themselves stuttering and unable to get the words out. So they never get around to asking a girl out. 
they avoid even trying to have a conversation with a girl who has caught their eye. People who lack confidence tend to go through life as spectators instead of as participants. They never get around to doing much because they are so fearful of failure. Confident people are doers. Could someone who lacks self-confidence ever become a corporate CEO, start a business, become a great athlete, become president of the United States? It's hard for me to see how. Can you name a president of the United States who lacked self-confidence? I can't. George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama. By the way, confidence is not arrogance. Confidence is not cockiness. Arrogant people often use arrogance as a way to mask their lack of confidence. Confidence is an attractive trait. Arrogance is not. The world loves to knock arrogant people down a few pegs. So it's not good for you if you are arrogant. People are drawn to confident people. They're repelled by arrogant people. Confident people smile. They're friendly. They're fun to be around. They're outgoing. Ronald Reagan was a confident person, not arrogant. Mother Teresa was a confident person, certainly not arrogant, not boasty. Can you see the difference? These are all supremely confident people. Life will be better for you in almost every way if you are a confident person. But is it possible for someone who lacks confidence to train themselves to become a confident person? I know with 100% certainty that this certainly is possible. So here's my 12-step program for how you can develop much more confidence. Step number one. Learn how to project confidence even if you are not at all confident. Brass it out. Honestly, I'm probably one of the best I know at this. I always project confidence even when I'm not the least bit confident. I'll give you one story just to illustrate the point. My first job out of college was as a junior reporter for the Washington Times in Washington, D.C. This was in 1982. I was assigned to the night desk mostly writing up local crime stories. I would call the Washington, D.C. Metro Police every night to get a rundown of the murders, the robberies, and other mayhem that had been committed that night, and then write them up for the paper. The Washington Times was located in a very bad area of the city, way up on Northeast New York Avenue. When 4 a.m. in the morning hit, it was time for me to go home. But no cabs would come to that area of town. Not at that time, because it was just too dangerous. Even if they could, I was unable to afford a cab anyway because I was basically paid minimum wage, being a junior reporter just out of college. I was making something like $6 an hour. So I would just walk home, about a two-mile walk through the worst part of Washington, D.C. at 4 a.m., dressed in a sport jacket or blazer, a necktie, some decent trousers, and carrying a briefcase. I basically looked like the ideal robbery target. But I figured, if I just looked very confident walking down the street, the gangsters and thugs would leave me alone. Maybe they figured out this was some kind of police setup, because there's no possible way this white kid could be walking down this street looking like that unless something was up. So that's what I did, for the most part without incident. But one night, I did get beaten up and robbed. A couple of teenagers came out of nowhere stuck a knife in my ribs, hit me in the face, broke my glasses, and took my wallet, which had about one dollar in it. Fortunately, it was summer, and some people, including the gangsters, came off their porches and out of the alleyways to chase the teenage thugs off. And I just told these guys the truth. I was in my first job making minimum wage, so I had to walk home every night because there were no buses and no taxis, and I couldn't afford to pay for a taxi anyway. So I was able to walk home that way every night after that without incident, protected by the gangsters who lined the streets, who knew me. I'd wave to them, say hello, and they'd ask me how I was doing. I think they admired me because I looked confident, unflappable, not afraid. They also knew, of course, I had no money. But if I had looked nervous and scared, I doubt I would have lasted very long out there. One of the great movies that teaches this lesson brilliantly is The Man Who Would Be King with Sean Connery and Michael Caine. 
This is one of my favorite movies of all time. In this movie, two British criminals manage to conquer much of Afghanistan by pretending they're gods. These two roguish guys actually conquer entire countries simply by projecting confidence. That is, by pretending they are gods. The scheme ultimately comes unraveled when Sean Connery decides he wants to marry a native girl. Terrified of marrying a god, because she thinks she's going to burst into flames, she scratches Sean Connery, and blood begins to flow. A god, of course, doesn't bleed, so it becomes clear to the natives that he's not a god at all. He's a fraud. So here's a scene from that movie when Sean Connery is bleeding and trying to make his way through the crowd of natives, hoping he can just pull off one more bluff. She bit me. What's he saying, Billy? Man is bleeding. They know. He says, not God, not devil, but man. The jig's up. For God's sake. We've got to brass it out, Danny. Danny, brass it out. Sometimes you just have to brass it out. My situation was a little like that when I would have to walk home from work every night at 4 a.m., traversing across one of the most dangerous areas of Washington, D.C. But I adopt something pretty close to this approach in other areas of my business and life as well. I believe a lot of the times you just have to brass it out. Pretend you belong there even if you really don't. Pretend you know what you're doing even if you really don't. The truth is, very few of us really know what we're doing. We pretend to be experts on the premise that, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. I mean, let's face it. If someone shows up at your house to fix your plumbing, how do you know if he knows what he's doing? How do you know if he knows anything about plumbing? You basically just hope he does. He seems to have a plumber's truck, and that's about all you know. You're just happy he's there and claims to know something about plumbing. I had this brassed out approach when I first opened my consulting business. When I quit my full-time paying job and launched my business, I had no customers and no clients. My philosophy has always been, if you're going to do something, just do it. Just dive in. Don't wade in. Don't do a lot of studying about it. Just dive in. Better yet, dive off the 10-meter platform. Make a big splash. For the first three months or so, I basically had no income. My wife was pretty freaked out about it. My business started out as a speech writing business. I'd written speeches for many famous political figures, including Presidents Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, that is, uh, Bush the father. So that was a natural business for me to start. But then I discovered that I could make a lot more money by writing direct mail advertisements. So I changed my business into a direct mail marketing business and pretended to know something about that. Basically, I decided to fake it until I make it. Of course, I studied up on direct marketing once I decided that that was the business for me. And I did learn a lot about direct marketing over time. And I went on to, in fact, build a multi-million dollar a year direct mail advertising agency. But when I first started my direct mail marketing agency, I really didn't know much about direct mail marketing, except that it was a pretty good way to make a lot of money. I had no trouble getting clients because even though I did not know much about direct mail marketing, I knew more than my clients did. I spoke with confidence on the subject. I brassed it out at meetings, spoke with authority, with flip charts, whiteboards, chalkboards, and PowerPoint presentations that looked real official. Well, I'm still in that business, having mailed about one billion letters that have generated more than one billion dollars in sales, donations, me and membership fees over the last 25 years or so. And I've written books on the subject, and I guess I'm considered an expert in the field. I've gotten to be good at it. I know a lot about direct marketing now, but it sure wasn't that way when I started my business. It, I was just very good at acting like I knew what I was doing. I used to joke that if someone came to me and asked me if I could build a bridge across the Potomac River, my answer would be, of course I can, absolutely. Then I would scramble like heck to find someone who could build the bridge. Fortunately, no one ever asked me to do that. My answer to prospective clients was always, yes, sure, we can do that, absolutely, no problem. Then I'd find a way to get it done. I've always believed that you learn best by doing anyway. And if you have to do something, you're going to learn how, fast. So that's step one, 
brass it out. Project confidence. Pretend you know what you're doing even if you really don't. Step two is to visualize success. Whatever you are doing, whatever you are setting out to do, visualize success. I like to play golf. And I've found that whenever you're setting up to hit a tee shot, you can either focus on the center of the fairway where you want to be, that's where you want the ball to end up, or you can look at all the hazards that are out there waiting for your ball. The water on the left, the sand traps in the rough on the right. If you spend your time on the tee focusing on the water that's running down the left of the fairway, that's probably where your ball is going to end up. Train your mind instead to block out all images of failure and disaster. Look down the middle of the fairway. Block out all hazards down the sides of the fairway. And then make a smooth, confident swing through the ball. If you think that way, your chances of success improve about tenfold. If you think you will fail, almost certainly you will fail. Take a look at what happened to this great professional golfer named Scott Hoke. He missed a two-foot putt that would have won him the Masters in 1989. Here's the heartbreaking clip of that disaster. Put for a par and a win. I remember saying I can still win this, but it doesn't look very good right now. <laughs> what can I tell you? Now obviously Scott Hoke could make that putt a thousand times in a row on the practice green. But when the Masters was on the line, his hand twitched ever so slightly. Why did his hand twitch? No doubt a negative thought crept into his mind. What if I miss? If I miss, I'll be the world's laughingstock. If I miss, I'll be the world's most famous loser. If I miss, all the fame, all the prestige and wealth that will come with winning the Masters will go up in smoke. So guess what? This great professional golfer, Scott Hoke, missed that two-foot putt because a negative thought crept into his head. He visualized failure instead of success. If you visualize success, if you visualize good things happening, you are far more likely to achieve success. Good things are far more likely to happen. Okay, I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're probably thinking, how could I visualize success if I lack self-confidence to begin with? How could I visualize success if I really haven't had all that much success? or any success? That's a great question, which brings me to step three. And that's to ask yourself, what is the worst thing that can happen if I fail? What is the worst thing that can happen to Scott Hoke if he missed that two foot putt to win the Masters? Well, the worst thing that can happen is exactly what happened. He missed the putt and he didn't win the Masters. But he was still a great golfer. Scott Hoke still won many other professional golf tournaments. He made tens of millions of dollars during his career as a great golfer, as one of the best golfers of his day. He had the lowest scoring average of any golfer in the world in 1986. 99.99% of golfers out there would have loved to have had the career that Scott Hoke had. And was Scott Hoke really the world's laughingstock for missing that putt at the Masters. No, people felt terrible for Scott Hoke. Anyone who has ever golfed can certainly imagine themselves missing that two, two foot putt. Every golfer has missed two foot putts. All golf fans admire Scott Hoke for the great golf career that he had. How many people in world history have ever even had a two foot putt to win the Masters? That in itself is an incredible achievement. How many people were good enough ever to be in that position? Not many, very few. A handful of people in history were good enough at golf even to be in that position. Life went on for Scott Hoke. He had a great golf career. That was just not quite as good as it could have been if he had made that two foot putt. Okay, so what? Life goes on, on to the next challenge. That's how you have to look at it. So let's say a girl catches your eye. You decide you want to ask her out. You're a little nervous. Maybe you're a lot nervous. You wonder how to get a conversation going. Should I just walk up and say hello? Or maybe sh I should wait for another opportunity, a better opportunity. A better opportunity that might never come up. What if I try to 
talk to her and she just turns her back and walks away? What if I start stuttering and stumbling and can't get the words out? You start thinking all these negative thoughts. Your fear causes you to do nothing. You become paralyzed by fear. So you walk away slump-shouldered and dejected. You kick yourself for being such a coward. You feel awful about yourself. But what's the worst thing that can happen if you walk up to her and just say hello? The very worst thing that can happen is she turns her back and walks away. So what? Even if she does that, you'll feel better about yourself just for having the courage to go up to her and say hello. But guess what? If you do say hello, if you say hello in a confident, friendly way with a nice smile, 90% of the time, she'll say hello back and will probably be happy to have a conversation with you. If the conversation seems to be going well, you can then ask her if she'd like to go get an ice cream. Again, what's the very worst thing that can happen? She might say no, or she might say she has to hurry off somewhere. Again, so what? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. You'll feel much better about yourself for trying and failing than not trying at all. You will also learn a lot from your failures. The more you walk up to girls and say hello, the better and more confident you'll become at this. You'll get better at this pretty soon. Walking up to pretty girls saying hello and starting a conversation will become no big deal. You'll be like a fish in water. You'll gain confidence. Confidence is an attractive quality in people. Females are drawn to guys who project confidence. The guy doesn't even have to be good looking if he projects a friendly air of confidence. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger was famous for dating beautiful women. My wife Wanda was not the least bit impressed with me when we first met. I met Wanda at a nightclub. I saw her and just walked up to her and said hello. Frankly, she was not the least bit interested in me at first. She tried to give me the brush off several times turned her back repeatedly to talk with her girlfriend, acted as though I wasn't there at all. But I just kept talking, making comments about this and that, asking her questions. I eventually asked her if she wanted to dance. She said okay. Not real enthusiastically. I was kind of surprised she did say okay, but I figured I'd ask. After dancing, she said bluntly, You know, you certainly are not the best-looking guy here. Far from it. But there's something I like about you. You seem very sure of yourself. And I agree with Wanda on that point. I'm not at all good looking, never have been, but I am a good conversationalist. I can pretty much talk with anyone about anything. I also never really fear failure or rejection. I even applied to Princeton when I was applying to colleges. Of course I was rejected, but I figured I'd apply anyway. Maybe I would get in by some kind of clerical error or fluke. When I was single, I always had the same attitude about walking up to girls and starting a conversation. The best way to start a conversation is to say hello. Nothing clever. The best way to continue a conversation is to ask questions. I, I really never fear failure. This doesn't mean I don't get nervous. I always feel nerves before a big event. But I don't let nerves paralyze me into inaction. Nor does this mean that I don't fail. I fail all the time. I fail constantly. I fail every day in all kinds of ways. But I really don't fear failure. I see failure as a challenge to overcome. I love the challenge. I've been an athlete all my life. You can't be an athlete and not constantly experience failure because there are always people out there who are better than you are. Two years ago at the age of 54, I, decide, I decided to take some breakdancing lessons. I happened to go to a breakdancing competition, what they call b-boying, and I was amazed at what incredible athletes these people were. I was amazed by their strength and their agility and what tremendous condition they're in. So I thought this might be a much more fun way to get back into shape than spending 45 minutes on the treadmill or two hours in the gym three days a week. I also thought breakdancing would be something fun to do at parties. So I started taking these breakdancing lessons with Chicago's number one breaker, a guy by the name of Shorty Brick, that's his breakdancing name, that's his b-boy name. After about two years of this, I started entering my first b-boy battles. Here's a clip from that.
Now, clearly, I was not anywhere near on the level of these 18 and 22 year old breakers who had been doing this for years. I'm basically a beginner now at the age of 56. But I've always believed in throwing myself into the arena just to see what happens. I've always believed in throwing myself into the fire because that's how we learn fastest. What's the absolute worst thing that can happen to me if I do that? Well, I could fall and I could mess up. So what? That would just put a spotlight on what I need to work on. It would be a learning experience. If you start seeing failure as just the fastest way to learn something new, you're not going to fear failure as much. The penalty for failing publicly is you might look a little dumb. So what? Life goes on. You try to do better next time. If you're not failing a lot, you're not pushing yourself hard enough. In these b-boy battles that I like to do, one of the comments I get from even these 20-year-old professional break dancers is they say, what I love about seeing you out there is how confident you seem to be. I usually say, thanks. I'm confident because what's the worst thing that can happen? If I screw it up, I just end up looking like, a, like an idiot. So what? Plus, I don't view this as me competing against these professional break dancers. I know they're way out of my league. I go out there to compete against myself. I go out there to see if I can improve on what I did last time. Some of these young breakers, who are much better than I am, tell me they won't compete in these battles because they get too nervous. They find it too nerve-wracking. They fear failing and looking stupid. So they're letting their fear of failure or fear of looking stupid stop them from doing what they really want to do. They are letting their fear stop them from making progress and from having fun. They say, I'll start competing when I get better. Why? Why not start competing now so you can get better faster? Stop letting fear of failure, fear of looking stupid, stop you from doing what you really want to do. As the Nike ad says, just get out there and start doing it. Throw yourself into the arena. If Tiger Woods asks you to play a round of golf with him, say heck yes. Don't think, what will Tiger Woods think if he sees how bad my golf game is? In other words, be a doer. Don't be a spectator. Be a participant in life. This brings me to step four in my 12-step program for building your self-confidence. And that's to have a realistic picture of success for you. So if Tiger Woods asks you to play a round of golf, don't expect to be anywhere near his level. Don't expect to impress him with your great golfing skills. He understands that he's a professional golfer. He's one of the greatest golfers of all time. Tiger Woods also knows what a recreational golfer is or what skill level a junior golfer is. Tiger Woods works on his golf game eight hours a day or more. This is his job. He's been doing this since he was two years old. He's not expecting you to put on any great golf show for him out there. He knows you're going to hit balls in the water, maybe even miss the ball completely. Your goal should not be to impress Tiger Woods. Your goal should be to put in a credible performance for you. You're not in a competition with Tiger Woods. Start seeing your competitions more as competitions against yourself, not against others. Tiger Woods is trying to be the greatest golfer of all time, not the second greatest golfer of all time. But that's not a realistic expectation for you, or frankly, for anyone else at this point. If you're the number 100 golfer in the world, a good goal would be to move into the top 50 and then the top 20. If you're the number 1,000th golfer, uh, ranked golfer in the world, your goal might be to move in the top 500. If you usually shoot around 90, your goal should be to shoot 85. You should always be in a competition with yourself, not so much with others. There's also an unhealthy kind of confidence, self-confidence, known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. These are people who overestimate their own abilities and take on unrealistic challenges. If you are a beginning skier, don't launch off on a double black diamond expert trail. If you're a beginning martial artist, don't jump in the cage with a professional cage fighter. That's just dumb and will definitely cause you to lose confidence as you are being rushed to the emergency room. Step five, and that's to push the limits of your comfort zone. Push the limits of your comfort zone, but gradually and systematically. The way you get better at something is to practice and to gradually push the limits of your comfort zone. If you push yourself too far outside your comfort zone or beyond your comfort zone too quickly before you're ready, you'll crash. You'll have a disaster. 
you might get hurt. And that will kill your confidence. That happened to me with ski jumping. I was a ski jumper when I was a kid growing up in Vermont. I was about 12 years old. And one day, I decided to move off the 30-meter jump and try the 60-meter jump. I panicked just before I reached the lip of the jump on the 60-meter hill. I tried to slam on the brakes at the last minute, slammed on the brakes too late, and I fell off the end of the jump, which was about a 15-foot drop straight down. I had a concussion and some broken ribs, no permanent injuries, but I, but I decided at that point to quit ski jumping and to just stick with alpine ski racing, my sport of choice when I was growing up. You certainly learn by pushing yourself. You have to push yourself, but you learn by pushing yourself slightly outside your comfort zone, a little at a time. Speaking of ski racing, I grew up in Vermont, and I used to wonder why so many top skiers in America were coming out of the Midwest, places like Minnesota and Michigan, where the tallest hills were no more than about 500 vertical feet, just tiny little hills. Why weren't the best ski racers coming out of Colorado? where all the big mountains are. What I concluded was this. In Colorado, the mountains are huge and dangerous. People who grow up skiing in Colorado are constantly trying to slow down, constantly trying to throw on the brakes. They are putting the brakes on all the time so that they don't careen off the 3,000 foot cliff. In Minnesota, the hills are small and flat. So the skiers there are always looking for ways to gain speed. So they learn how to gain speed, how to ski fast, instead of how to slow down, how to brake. And I think that's why so many of the best ski racers have come out of the Midwest, where the hills are small. I think that method of learning and gaining confidence applies to almost all learning. If you try to move your child into algebra before she's mastered basic foundational math skills, you will impede your child's progress and destroy her confidence. Not only will the child never really learn algebra, but the child will never even learn basic math and will sour entirely on the subject of math. So you certainly want to push yourself and challenge yourself to move beyond your current level, but not so quickly that you crash disastrously or fail so miserably that you shatter your confidence. I made the mistake once of taking my six-year-old son on a roller coaster that was too big for him. He had never been on a roller coaster before. I should have taken him on the baby roller coaster first. The experience on the big roller coaster was so terrifying for him that he never went on another roller coaster again, and I very much regret that. Life should be fun and challenging, not terrifying. This brings me to step six, and that's training and preparation. The better you are at something, the more confident you will be. You're not going to be confident going into your algebra exam if your basic foundational math skills are weak. You're not going to be confident with your essay writing assignment if you don't know the rules of grammar, can't spell, and aren't used to writing. I'm not going to feel confident about going into a combat situation without extensive combat training. Special operations military trainers say it takes rehearsing the same movement 30,000 times before that movement becomes instinctive. If you have to think before making the move, you can't be confident. You can't be sure of yourself. That will make you slow. That will cause you to make the wrong decisions. Training and preparation are critical to your confidence. I used to fear public speaking because I wasn't used to public speaking. I overcame that fear with preparation. I would write out the speech or lecture and then rehearse it, rehearse it many times. I just figured very little could go wrong if I wrote out the speech and essentially memorized it. As I got better at public speaking, I found that I could deliver a speech from just an outline or index cards to make the speech sound more casual and off the cuff, more conversational. The better you get at something, the more you can improvise along the way. Take dancing. First you learn basic steps, but if you just do the basic steps, that looks too mechanical. But the better you get at the basic steps, the more you can improvise and start actually dancing. But you can't dance without first learning the foundational basic steps and then practicing those until they become instinctive natural, second nature, like walking. But don't let the need to train and prepare prevent you from jumping into the arena even before you're not fully confident in your preparation. Again, you learn fastest by doing and failing and learning from your failures. You won't learn how to play golf just by reading books and going to the golf range. You also need to get out there on the course and keep score 
enter competitions. It's one thing to practice a piano at home in private. It's something entirely different to perform a public piano recital. It's one thing to train for combat. You're on a whole new level if, you ha if you've had actual combat experience. There's just no comparison. So training and preparation are crucial, but there's no substitute for getting into the arena and testing your skills preferably against people about your skill level or slightly better. Step seven, teach something that you are an expert at. There are five primary ways to learn and master a subject or a skill. You can learn something by reading about it or hearing someone talk about it. These are the two weakest methods of learning. You can also learn by seeing, by doing, and by teaching. The most powerful ways to learn a skill are by doing it and by teaching it. If you teach it, you really need to have studied how to do it and then organize your presentation into a step-by-step -step system that can be understood by beginners. Then you become a recognized authority on the subject or skill that you are teaching. This will contribute to building your self-confidence. People admire and respect teachers and coaches. You can start by making tutorials for YouTube. This is a great way to learn how to teach. Step number eight. Learn to be a good public speaker. I believe this is hugely important. There is almost nothing better for developing your self-confidence than becoming a teacher, a recognized expert on a subject, and who is also a compelling public speaker. Most people are terrified by public speaking. Most people have never been asked to teach anything, much less speak to an audience on the subject. When people are asked what is their greatest fear in life, a sizable portion of the population will answer public speaking. I used to fear public speaking. I still get nervous when I have to speak to a big crowd, especially if I haven't done that in a while. I would recommend taking a class on public speaking. I took a public speaking class at Dartmouth College. It was one of the most useful and practical classes I took. Basically, the key to good public speaking is to write down the speech and rehearse it many times so that it flows naturally. The more you rehearse and practice, the more confident you will feel with your speech. Most public speakers who do this for a living have a number of set speeches and lectures that they deliver and that they have essentially memorized. When you see comedians on the Comedy Channel, they all have their routines memorized perfectly, right down to getting their pauses and cadences exactly right. Because if that's not right, the whole effect of the joke is lost. Once you've basically memorized your speech, you can then ad-lib a bit along the way to make it sound more natural and conversational. But all great speakers essentially memorize their speeches. When they get off text or go off teleprompter, the speech usually gets pretty messed up. They end up taking up a hospital bed. It costs when, if you, they just gave, you gave them treatment early and they got some treatment and a, a breathalyzer or an inhalator, not a breathalyzer. Delivering a good speech is no different from delivering any kind of great performance. Great performances are practiced and rehearsed over and over again. The more you practice and rehearse, the more confidence you'll gain. The feedback you receive from the audience will further fuel your confidence. People will start to see you as a leader. That will add to your confidence. Success tends to lead to more success, and that builds confidence. So how can you get practice public speaking? Lots of ways. Sign up for a class on public speaking. If no public speaking classes are offered at your high school, check out your local community college. There are sure to be public speaking classes there. Start a podcast. Volunteer to do scripture readings and make announcements at your church. Teach a Sunday school class. Lead a Cub Scout pack. Coach a sport. Very few people want to do public speaking at all, so there's really no limit to your public speaking opportunities. Step number nine. Frankly, your appearance and hygiene are very important to your confidence. Everyone and anyone can look good. If you just eat right, keep yourself in good physical shape. Work out regularly. Wear some decent clothes. Put on a drop or two of cologne. Brush your teeth. Use some teeth whitener. Wash your hair. Floss. Use deodorant. Get a haircut that looks normal. Work on eliminating the nervous tics you might have. The shaking leg, the picking nose, the biting of nails, sticking your finger in your ear. Farting. Whatever the nasty habits are that you have, find a way to stop doing them. They're off-putting. The truth is, people do judge a book by its cover. You don't have to look like Clark Gable or 
Cary Grant, Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, Kate Upton, Christy Brinkley, or Raquel Welch, almost no one looks like these people. And by the way, even these people don't look like these people. It's amazing what makeup and camera lighting can accomplish. But almost anyone has the capacity to look good. You might be a great person that has a lot to offer, but if you look sloppy, smell bad, or out of shape, and do annoying things, people aren't going to want to have much to do with you. You'll notice people moving away from you. And that will have a significant negative impact on your self-confidence. Look more like this. Not like this. Or this. Gaining self-confidence is not only about your attitude. Many people really do need to fix some things that are pretty easy to fix if you just tend to them. For example, pick a workout routine and a schedule that you will stick to. Take some pride in your appearance. You'll feel much better about yourself and you will gain self-confidence. Step number 10, fix your body language. Did you know that a lot of research shows that your facial expressions and how you position your body not only projects confidence or lack of confidence, but actually produces significant and immediate changes in your body chemistry to create more confidence or lack of confidence. According to research by Harvard Business School professor Amy Cuddy, there are certain body positions that cause your testosterone levels to increase and cortisol hormone to decrease. Testosterone is the dominance hormone. Cortisol is the stress hormone. When you feel under stress, your cortisol level rises. When you feel confident, your testosterone level rises. If you want to feel more confident, you want your testosterone levels to surge and your cortisol levels to recede. So here are some body positions, power positions, that actually achieve this effect, according to Professor Cuddy. Animals also understand the principle that how they position their body matters, not just to the other animal, but also to themselves. Even if you're small, you can project confidence. Not only are you projecting authority by how you position your body, you are feeling more powerful, confident, and authoritative by how you position your body. You probably actually know this is true from your own personal experience. For example, you smile automatically when you're happy. You don't have to think about it. It's automatic. But let's say you're not happy, but you want to look happy. You want to project happiness. So you force yourself to smile instead of frown. You force yourself to look happy. Simply the act of forcing yourself to smile will actually make you feel happier. Smiling, by the way, also projects confidence. When you consciously try to project confidence, this helps you feel more confident. If you pretend to be happy, relaxed, and confident, even if you're not, you'll begin to feel more happy, relaxed, and confident. Conversely, if you look unhappy, nervous, and insecure, that's how you're going to feel. I can tell whether you're a confident person or a person with no confidence just by looking at your body language. I can look out over a crowd of people that I'm speaking to and I can tell who the confident people are and who the people are who lack confidence just by how they're sitting in their chairs. How do you think the bullies at school pick out the ones they're going to bully? Bullies know who they can push around and victimize just by looking at them. They can see it in the body language. The mind and the body are connected. Your body language telegraphs how you're feeling. But how you carry yourself, your expressions, how you position your body when you're talking, also impacts how you feel about yourself. That's why your parents tell you to look people in the eye when you talk to them, to smile, to have a firm, confident handshake, to stand up straight, don't slump in your chair, speak up so people can hear what you're saying. Your parents probably don't have all the scientific research that shows why this is important. They just know that it's important for you to look like you belong there. What your parents might not know is that looking like you belong there will actually change your body chemistry so that you feel like you belong there. So when you ask a girl out on a date, look like this, not like this. When you ask for a pay raise at your job, look like this, not like this. When you're speaking to a group, look like this, not like this. Now, obviously, you don't want to overdo it with the power positions and all that. Constantly striking gorilla poses when talking to people will certainly be off-putting and not appropriate. We do live in a civilized society, after all, not in the animal kingdom. 
If you're going in for a job interview, you don't want to look like this. That would be projecting confidence in an inappropriate way. Remember what I said about the difference between confidence and arrogance? People like confident people, not arrogant people. But you also don't want to look like this. This is how you should look in a job interview. Confident, relaxed, but also respectful. Leaning forward slightly when you speak is a nice, subtle power pose. Shows confidence. But you also don't want to be a close talker. That's off-putting. It might actually be a good idea, however, to strike your gorilla poses and rocky poses in the bathroom before the job interview to raise your testosterone level, which will help make you feel more confident. A firm handshake is certainly good, but don't crush the person's hand either. Smile and look happy, certainly, but you don't want to have a smile constantly plastered on your face like the Joker either. That too will look odd and off-putting. The point is, your body positions, your facial expressions, how you carry yourself and how you speak, not only affect peop how people see you, but also how you see yourself, how you actually feel about yourself. If you look and sound confident, relaxed, and happy, you will actually start to feel more confident, relaxed, and happy. If you look sure of yourself, you will start to feel more sure of yourself. Step number 11. Learn to like yourself. Now, some of what I'm telling you might sound like I'm asking you to be inauthentic. I'm essentially telling you to fake it until you make it. There is certainly an aspect to that. I do believe in brassing it out. We've got to brass it out, Danny! Danny, brass it out! And to some extent, faking it until you make it. But I'm not telling you to change fundamentally who you are. The opposite. You need to learn how to be confident in who you are. A big part of confidence is liking yourself. By liking yourself, I don't mean be satisfied where you are. We all want to improve ourselves. We need to improve ourselves. We want to maximize our potential. I mean be true to who we are. Don't try to be someone else. Being true to who you are and liking yourself is a big part of gaining confidence. How can you ever be confident if you don't like you? My youngest daughter, Olivia, had a slight speech impediment kind of like Barbara Walters or Drew Barrymore when she was young. Olivia is in middle school, and she's big into theater. When she was going out for all these roles and plays, all these big parts, I wondered how that would work out. But she tried out for these lead roles in some pretty big, elaborate local theater productions, and she landed the lead role in Madeline and Peter Pan and other productions. Yep, my daughter played Peter Pan. And these were some pretty, pretty big productions. A thousand people in the audience paying $12 each for tickets almost every night of the week for two weeks. I think a big reason Olivia landed these roles is she was supremely confident, but also very authentic. Her slight speech impediment was distinctive, but it also made her real, made her authentic. It was endearing. The audiences loved her. Several people told me that what most struck them about Olivia was her confidence on stage, her stage presence. Not everyone can have perfect diction like Walter Cronkite, but you can make it in broadcasting and acting, even if you have a speech impediment. Look at Barbara Walters. Saturday Night Live used to make fun of Barbara Walters, calling her Baba Wawa. I didn't like it. Um, I didn't want to be Baba Wawa. Welcome to Not For Ladies Only. I'm Barbara Wawa. And tonight we'll be talking to an actual living legend. But she certainly did well. I think she's the highest paid female bro broadcaster of all time. Her way of speaking became her trademark. It's what made her unique in broadcasting. Or think about the great folk and rock pop star Bob Dylan. He really can't sing at all. He has a monotone, nasally voice. But he's one of the greatest rock and folk artists of all time. By any objective measure, Bob Dylan can't sing. He has no range at all in his voice. But that was a big part of why people loved him so much. He sounded pretty much like the average person singing. They loved his authenticity. His authenticity is what spoke to people, what made him so big. Plus the fact, of course, that he was a great songwriter. Hey, Mr. Tambourine Man, play a song for me. In the jingle jangle morning, i come following you. Bob Dylan had supreme confidence in who he was. When asked by a reporter if his music was folk music or rock music, Dylan answered, I don't know, it's my music. 
So when I say fake it until you make it, it's much more about you convincing yourself that you can do it than convincing others that you can do it. If you've convinced yourself you can't do it, you'll never do it. But if you find ways to convince yourself that you can do it, if you believe that you can do it, then you've actually discovered the real you. You found out who you really are and what you are really capable of. You are no longer paralyzed by fear. You have been liberated from your fear of failing to discover your true potential, the real you. That's not really faking it until you make it. That's training your mind into believing that you can do it, then discovering that you really can do it. The lie was in thinking that you could not do it. What you've done is tricked your negative thinking mind that was lying to you that you can't do it into finding the amazing truth about you. Step number 12, and that's ask the right questions about yourself. You really do have to train your mind into thinking positively about yourself. There really is enormous power in positive thinking. Some of it is just in the way you ask questions about yourself. Let's say you want to lose 20 pounds. Well, you don't want to ask, why can't I lose 20 pounds? You'll never lose the 20 pounds with that mindset. The truth is, we can all lose 20 pounds if we need to. The question is, how do I lose 20 pounds? And what's the right weight loss program for me that I will follow? Don't ask, why don't girls like me? Ask yourself instead, how many girls have I walked up to and said hello to this week and had a conversation with this week? Don't ask yourself, why can't I make the track team? Ask yourself instead, what do I need to do to make the track team? Which event is best for me? Is my body type best designed for sprinting, long distance running, high jumping, or shot putting? Don't ask yourself, why do my business enterprises keep failing? Ask yourself, what are successful entrepreneurs, what are successful business people doing that I'm not doing? There actually is a formula for building a successful business that anyone can follow. You then just have to follow the time-tested, proven formula for doing that. It's like hitting a golf ball correctly. There's a proven, scientific method to it. Follow the method. Follow the proven formula. It's not magic. Then expect success. Learn to visualize success instead of disaster. Success then tends to lead to more success. And that builds confidence which then leads to setting bigger and bigger goals for yourself. Like the pine trees lining the winding road I've got a name I've got a name Like the singing bird and the croaking toad I've got a name I've got a name